good afternoon. Glad you joined us for our weekly Bible study. And uh, thankful to the Lord again for uh, those that have gotten well. Some are still under hospital care, so we'll continue to be praying for one another in the church family. Uh, I, I want us to look at a subject today in our study in Psalm 12 uh, that I think speaks to where we live. And, and I think it's important for us to look at uh, and realize that God is over all things, and, uh, and we can count on that. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you again for this privilege to come together. Lord, as a church family, we were mindful of the needs around us. Lord, that you might make us uh, to respond like Jesus. Help us to be proactive in it, Lord. Help us to be thoughtful, and uh, Lord, as well as prayerful uh, for them in that way. Thank you again for this time that we've set up and, and uh, taken to look into the Word of God that you might continue to teach us, encourage us by it, and Lord, help us to uh, be more like you in this area as well. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we're in Psalm chapter 12, and we're looking here at a song of lament, uh, learning to uh, cry uh, out to the Lord, that is. And... Uh, uh, the topic before me today is uh, social justice. Uh, social justice. Now that term uh, began more of an economic uh, uh, dealings uh, in the thought of it, making sure that there was uh, uh, equal uh, footing on, in the workplace, in the pay scale, and uh, since those early days, uh, the, the term social justice has been very fluid and, uh, and, and it's meant many different things to uh, many people. Uh, what it's intended to do is assure uh, uh, fairness in society for all people and that's profitable when the purpose of social justice is set forth for all people uh, but it gets complicated when they take that segment uh, of society that's marginalized and try to make that the social platform of the day. Uh, in the United Nations 2006, uh, they came up with a document called Social Justice in an Open World, and they said social justice may be broadly understood as the fair and compassionate distribution of the fruits of economic growth. I think, again, reflecting the original intention uh, there, that the uh, economic uh, fairness uh, might be seen and known throughout uh, the culture. Today, uh, it's being ruled by platforms from anywhere from uh, uh, racial uh, equality to gender equality. And, uh, and it's become certainly something far different than it was. Uh, but one thing for sure, if we want to know what social justice is, how it works well, we can look into the Word of God and see it. Social justice in itself isn't a new idea. It isn't a bad idea. As a matter of fact, it is uh, God's idea. In the, in the sense of having a biblical perspective on our world, then we will agree that God treats all men, women, in fairness. We read in the New Testament, God is no respecter of persons. In other words, he doesn't favor one over the other. He doesn't have prejudice against any one or any one group. Uh, God is certainly uh, fair. I like what I found about John, uh, from John Stott. Uh, John uh, was speaking on social justice, and he wrote this, The cross is a revelation of God's justice as well as his love. If there's to be social justice, we could call it world justice, it comes from God. He is the ultimate judge. And what he says is true, and all men are judged at the divine bar. And God himself will judge all men with equity, with fairness, and uh, without any favoritism. We all long for truth. We long for justice. Human government, it's flawed. We know that. Even as our own judgment, as, as parents, as parents we can see that we're not very good when it comes to having a 100% score on 
uh, making the, the right kind of judgments in this world. But God always makes the right judgment. So in our text uh, tonight, we, we know we've been looking at this text, Psalm chapter 12, and, and David has been lamenting to the Lord. He, he cries out to the Lord, help, because the godly man ceases, the faithful failing from among uh, men. It was a desperate situation when the spiritual uh, man, when the church uh, begins to fade or fail in a society. It's a desperate situation, and there were many things that brought that about. Among them in this day, David points out that they were being exasperated, marginalized, minimized, burdened by the evil leaders of the day. And we looked at that in our time together uh, last time. Uh, and, and he calls upon God to, to help. Now I realize this world, we've got evil leaders. It was true in David's day. It's true in our day. But that doesn't mean that we're not without resource or recourse. Because we have a God who's very interested and active in the affairs of this life, of this world. If there are injustices going on on earth by evil or wicked men, then we know that God himself is involved, that God has committed himself to being involved. He, he cares about what's going on in homes. He cares about children being abused. He, he cares about the wife who's treated unfairly. He cares about the boss who, who's, who's, who's treating his employee, employee with uh, a, a, a heavy fist uh, who's not appreciated him uh, whatever it might be God sees all injustices today and he doesn't wink at them he doesn't turn his head away he is uniquely concerned we are in on good ground when we join David and cry out for help in light of the fact that there are, injust there are injustices going on in this world We've got to think of the, the issue of abortion, millions of babies murdered, and the fact that right now that issue is on the table, uh, and we ought to be praying about that. Is God concerned? Is He watching? Is He working? Will He make this right in the end? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's what we learn about our God. David is crying out, not for his own case, but he's pleading the case of those who are being wronged. He looks beyond his own plight, and he looks to the needs around him. Uh, we read it here in the text in verse, uh, verse 5. He sees the oppression of men, the burdens of men, the unfairness, uh, the way they're being troubled. Uh, by, by un ungodly leaders. So our text tonight, I want to zero right in, if I can, with you at verse 5. At verse 5. Because the Lord will help. And he says this here in verse 5, For the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy. Now that's the cause. The Lord says, For the oppression of the poor and the crying of the needy. I like it the way the ESV writes it, uh, because the poor are plundered and the needy groan. That puts it in pretty easy English, doesn't it? The poor are plundered. They don't have anything anyway, and they're still being robbed. Right now we're being promised all kinds of financial and uh, infrastructure gain, but that doesn't make the poor man richer. Eventually, somebody's got to pay that bill. <laughs> Our government doesn't seem to be very good at understanding these things. They like to create gifts with nothing behind them oftentimes. But here it's the poor. They're again being plundered as if they had any more to give. And the sighing of the needy. And the Lord, the Lord hears their cries, their sighs. They don't dare speak out because they'd be troubled. They'd be taken to task again. So they groan. They sigh in silence. But God hears their cries. God
God hears their groans. God hears the prayers of his people. He sees the injustices made on earth. And God commits himself to being involved. That's what we're looking at here now in verse 5. For the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy, the Lord says this, Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I like that. All the words of this chapter, those are the words that have captured my attention over the past week. Now will I arise, saith the Lord. Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him who threatens him, puffs at him, breathes out fire, slaughterings. We talked last time about the words of these troublemakers. By their words, they thought they, they sought to destroy other men or control them. Powerful words, but God's more powerful. There was a common expression. I was one of seven kids as we grew up, and mother wasn't much of a dis disciplinarian by, by, by way of being a strong person that way. But we heard a phrase at our home oftentimes, and it carried weight. Wait till your father, you grew up in that home too? <laughs> Wait till your father gets home. The thought of dad returning home and the thought of my own disobedience, uh, they were in contrary to one another. I didn't want to see dad coming home if I was going to be in trouble, uh, but that was often the case. That's what the Lord says here to these troublemakers in the, on the earth. I will rise up. And I'm coming, and I'm going to fix it. By fixing it, it says here, he's going to set in safety the one who's today being oppressed. He's going to free them. He's going to relieve them. He's going to come to their aid, just like our God, isn't it? To come to our help at a time of need to, to minister to us. How many of us? Need that even now, we know that. But, but the initiative is what gets me here. Not just the Lord says, one day I'll straighten this mess out. No, he says it this way. Now, it's a time word important in the scripture. Now will I arise. You can picture the Lord just getting up from supper like the Lord Jesus did in chapter 13 of John. And, and he rises up from the table. And he has a purpose in it. The Lord's heard David's prayer. He's seen the godless in society. And he says, it's now it's my time to act. God doesn't act earlier than now. Now is in his time frame, his, his purposes. But David had prayed, and, 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 and the godly were failing. The, the, the faithful were failing from among men. They were disappearing from the scene. There was a lot of difficulty going on in that day. And the Lord said, Now will I arise. Isn't that good to know when sometimes we pray and we don't see an answer to it? To know that at just the right time, God himself will arise. I thought back to Israel. And over the years in Israel, some 400 years, the pharaohs had become more difficult toward the people of God, the Jews. And they gave them more burdens and they made them slaves and they treated them, they were hard taskmasters, treated them terribly, wronged them often, injustice all over the place. Because they were great in number and because they were God's people. And after 400 years, God tolerated these pharaohs and the injustices against his people. And after 400 years, the Lord said, Now I will arise. I'll arise, and I'll give my people salvation. I will deliver my people. And he called Moses. He said, Moses, I've heard the cries of my people. You go and lead them out for me. God prepared at his time a man, Moses, that at just the right time, Moses might be ready to lead the people on out. And he did. We know that one for sure. Pharaoh was a hard taskmaster. 
The enemies were all around. But God not only freed the Israelites and brought them out at Passover, but God also judged those who deserve to be judged. And he judged them with fairness, with equity. And he drowned the horse and rider in the sea. He dealt with the enemies in that sense. I found it interesting, uh, the Apologetic Study Bible has a comment on this phrase, now, I will, now will I rise up. And he says, it's often tied together, and I read through the scriptures quite commandingly so, it's often tied together with, uh, with the moving of the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, in the, New, in the Old Testament. <clears throat> we find it right in, uh, right in Numbers, we find it. Uh, that uh, the idea of uh, the Lord rising up to lead them. And we know that throughout Israel's journey in the wilderness, God would, uh, through the Shekinah glory cloud, God would rise up and he'd go forward. And he'd lead them as a mighty army. And as a victorious leader, God would lead his people. And uh, it's used in that sense in Psalm 68, verse 1. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Later in that verse, let them flee. I think when God arises, that's just the case. And that will be the case here. We know at the end of the book of Revelation, there will be a time in Revelation 19 speaks of it, when the Lord Jesus will arise from his throne in heaven and he will come down to earth with judgment upon the unbelieving world against the enemies of God's people, Israel. And he will relieve and save, chapter 12 of Revelation, he will save his people, Israel. And at the same time, he will make war with the Antichrist and his unholy host. That's who our God is. Why doesn't he come now? Why doesn't he come today? Why doesn't he bail me out of my financial mess or my relationships? Why doesn't he deal with the people who have treated me so wrongly in life? The people who seem to have gotten away with all the hurt that I've, I've endured. Where has God been when I was younger? with what's going on in my home. Where is God? Why isn't God doing something? God will do something. He will relieve the oppressed. And He will judge, bring judgment against those who wrong another. God will require this at the hand of every man. You say, well, why doesn't He do it now? Well, we've been in that and I dwell reading this week on forgiveness. We would make very good judges. We want vengeance and we want it now because we have an agenda of our own and it's not necessarily justice. Vengeance, from God's perspective, we could call justice. But vengeance, from our perspective, would be usually anything but that. I thought that was thought-provoking as well. But one thing for sure, the Lord does rise up and lead His people. That's who he is. That is what he does. That's what we're learning about God tonight in, in chapter 12, and, and it's true in our day. In Luke 11, the Lord Jesus tells a parable in contrast. Some parables they just <clears throat> excuse me, teach us what God is like. They, they compare something or someone to God, and they teach the lesson by way of comparing. Some parables are a contrast, and they contrast here, it's contrast, contrasting one person in, uh, toward God, or with God. And this person is not at all like God, and there's a reason for it. I, I wish I had time to turn there with you, but I can only reference it. Uh, and uh, in Luke 11, it's where Jesus tells the story about a man who has some late night visitors drop in. And he has nothing food-wise to share with them. And, uh, and he sa it says he, he went at midnight, he went to his neighbor's house, and he knocked, and he said, Friend, could you lend me some loaves? Companies drop by, I have nothing to serve them. 
And the guy inside says, hey, come back tomorrow. We're already in bed. I can't help you tonight. Please, please. And he persists to knock. And finally, his neighbor gets out of bed and comes. And it says this, verse 8. Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Now here's the question. Why does God help us? Because he loves us. Because he cares. Because we belong to him. That's why he, he comes. This man was not like that. Even though he said he was a friend, he wasn't willing to rise up. Not willing to get out of bed. But because he was pushy, because the friend was persistent, it said because he of his import, importunity, he will rise. Could I add the word reluctantly? And give him as much as he needs. He wasn't rising out of generosity, out of kindness, out of compassion, concern. No, 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 no. This man said, I will rise to get this jerk off my back. I want to go to sleep. Well, that's the lesson Jesus is giving here. God is not like that. He, he doesn't need us to badger him into doing good things for his people into coming to our, our rescue. No, friend, the fact that we cry like a child at night, crying for mom and dad's attention, crying for their help. Uh, the mother runs to the room. The father sleeps through it, maybe. Not necessarily. But God doesn't need to be badgered to come to our aid. He's always on the side of right and on the side of justice. That's, friend, social justice. And that's who God is and, and what he does. Again and again through the Psalms and in, in the book of Isaiah, I find that. Psalm 919, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. What a good prayer for today, isn't it? Arise, Lord, O let not man prevail. Isaiah 14, 22 the Lord says this, For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord. And he talks about cutting off Babylon. And I, one more I'll give you. Isaiah 33.10. I like this. Here we find a threefold persistence on God's end teaching us about how He moves. How prayer moves the hand of God and the heart of God. And God will hear, and God will answer. Psalm, Isaiah 33, 10. Now I will rise, saith the Lord. Now I will be exalted. That's the key, the purpose of it all. Now I will lift up myself. No one needs to stir God up. He stirs himself up. When you have a, a problem in your life, when I have needs in my life, we don't need to beg God and, 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 and grovel around in the dirt. No, friend, God is hearing our, our, our cries. And His heart's moved. And He wants to help. But we need to be patient and wait on God's time. I thought of our own lives and I, I thought about this. How can we respond in light of this lesson to corrupt government today? To those who are being marginalized, oppressed, plundered by taxes. How should we respond? How did David respond? We should cry out to the Lord, knowing He hears, and in His perfect time, He will come. Secondly, I ask another question. What can we learn about God and His justice from our lesson tonight? What can you learn about God? Is He fair? Is His ear open to the size of his people. Hey, sometimes we, we don't know what to say. We just know this, in this whole world we're living in, things are bad and you're not getting well anytime soon. They're getting worse. The days are getting darker. We, we know that the, the end times are going to be difficult. They're going to be perilous, we read in the scripture. What can we learn about God? Is he interested in what's going on? Is he turning his head away from it? Hiding is up. No, 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 no. God sees it all. 
He's sizing it up. He's hearing the cries of his people. He's seeing the injustices against those who are oppressed, the unborn babes. He's seeing that. He knows it all. He's calculating it all. And in his time, God will rise up and make all of it right. Lastly, how shall you and I respond to injustices in our lives? Personally, how should we respond? What if God doesn't seem to come quick enough or answer the way I want him to answer? What, what is the lesson I need to learn? I need to trust him, don't I? I need to trust him. I love the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, 20. The Lord says this, he that tes testifies these things, the Lord, says this, surely this is the closing words of God's book to us. The closing words, chapter 22, verse 20 of Revelation. The Lord says this to you and I, as we look ahead to the time of Revelation, as we look to the end times and know how difficult the days are and the difficulty that's coming, surely, the Lord says, I come quickly. Amen. I like that. Surely, the Lord says, His word to us, the reader of the Scripture, looks down the road and sees all that's going on, even the wickedness, obviously, of the book of Revelations involved here. The Lord says this, Hear me now, surely, confidence, surely I come quickly. Then we look out the window and we say, Lord, where are you today? It's not on our timetable, it's God's. God's not letting a thing slip by. He's got it all down. He's going to deal with it well at the right time. I come quickly. And it closes, we say this at the closing of the verse, Oh, Lord, even so, come Lord Jesus. If he promises, surely I'm coming. I come quickly. The, the language there means I'm already on the way. Then we sit back and we thank God and say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Well, I hope that's been an encouragement to you. I hate to leave the chapter, but we're going to look at some great things about God's Word, how true His Word is. We can count on what He says here. And, uh, and how at every stage of human history... That there will be evil men walking this earth. But God is the judge of all. Hey, thanks for joining. Don't forget, God's not going to fail us. God will rise up. He's coming quickly. Hang on to the Lord. Hang on to hope, faith in Him. Father, thank you again for these words to us. Lord, help us to be confident. Help us not to be discouraged. But, Lord, to be reminded of the words that you speak to us, behold, I come quickly. Lord, may we trust in you. May we hope in your return, knowing, Lord, that you will make all wrongs right in your sight. And we praise your name for it. Amen. God bless. Have a great rest of the week. And, Lord willing, see you in God's house on Sunday. Bless you now.